I would say let's begin in the book of Daniel. We'll get there in about five minutes. We'll say chapter four. We are on part two of about six of the names and the titles of God. And we're doing, in particular, an Old Testament concentration. How many believe that all scripture is inspired of God? So that means even the old parts we skip over, right? A little plug, it's been a joy to go through the book of Amos on Thursday evenings. It's a book that many people skip over. How many of you have been a part of that study? You, you've come to just love that book, afresh and anew. It, it speaks to us today, though. It was written some 27, 2800 years ago, if my math serves me correct. Book of Daniel in a moment. We're beginning a, t a sermon, uh, part two of a series on the names and the titles of God, Old Testament concentration. And again, when, when you talk about names and titles, they're, they're invitations to come to understand the character and the nature of the Lord better, that you might know him and his ways more. It's not like James or Misty in a sense. These names and titles, they're revelatory. They, 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 they bring you into understanding the deeper aspects of who and what God is. God is a multifaceted being. All lies this way. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. So in our own ways, we are complex beings. How many of you are married? Raise a hand. True or false? Your, your husband or wife, they're just complex. I don't get Misty. I, it's 21 years. I am no closer to fathoming you, your heart, your ways. And probably to a, a similar degree, though men are relatively simple creatures, I, I would put forth. Th there's mystery here. Now, if that is true on, on the same creative order, we're both humans, how much more mystery and wonder is there to the Lord? And again, God invites us in by revealing himself some, in Scripture, and particularly through his names and titles. Now, we covered three, I believe, titles last week. El Olam. Who has my, where are my note takers? What does El Olam mean? The everlasting or the eternal God. Gang, he's been around a while, and he'll be around a minute too. He's the same how often, by the way? Yesterday, today, and forever. So God is unchanging. He's everlasting. What he was yesterday, he'll be today and tomorrow. So when you see him operating in Scripture, it's okay to say, Lord, if you could do it way back when, fill in the blank. Why not now? We talked about El Shaddai. I think there was one note taker, Miss Crystal, meaning God Almighty. You know, it's funny, we sing to Jill every night. Well, Misty sings, I attempt. And what's the song we sing where she flexes? We are weak, but he is. He, you know the song, right? And she does this, and she flexes. And I feel her muscles, and they're kind of non-existent, but it's super cute. But she's beginning in her early age to understand that God is a being who is powerful by nature. And as adults, how powerful is he? He's all-powerful. He's able to do whatever he desires to do. Whatever is in accord with his will and purpose, he has the capacity to execute. And finally, El Roy, not El Roy, El Roy. The God who sees, but it's a little more specific, and I love this nuance to it. The God who sees me. And that was a, a name or a title that came forth in the midst of crisis and brokenness. If that characterizes your life and living in this month of 2024, he still sees you. And if he sees you and you reach out to him, El Shaddai begins to activate the eternal God, the powerful God, and he works on our behalf. Now, I have four we're going to try to get through this morning. I promise two or three. And I believe I even have these on the slide behind me. So little Jax, if you just hit to the right or Marty, we'll start there. Now, we skipped this one last week. This is the one we're probably going to spend the most time on only because this name or title uh, kind of is connected to a longer story in the book of Daniel. El Elyon. You want to know what it means? I gave it away last week. It means the most high God. This name or title particularly reveals his might, his sovereignty, and his supremacy. His might, his power, his sovereignty, his, his supremacy. 
This name or title appears about 30 times in the Old Testament. 19 or so are found in the book of Psalms. I'm going to read a couple of them to you. Don't turn there. You can download the notes this week. Psalm 7, the author says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. Underlying Hebrew, El Elyon. Psalm 9, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, El Elyon, you who reign supreme over all things. Psalm 57, I cry out to God, most high, to God who vindicates me. And you've probably heard of Psalm 91 before. Whoever dwells in the shadow of the most high, what do you think the underlying term is? It's that will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, when you read through the Old Testament scriptures, and it's also evident in the New, God is always presented as reigning supreme over all things. Help the pastor out. Who's heard of the Lord's Prayer before? Really, the disciples' prayer. How does it start? Our Father. So there's intimacy, there's tenderness, there's connection. What's next? Where is he seated? Why is that significant? It's more than just his GPS gang. It's more than just his geographical location. It's meant to remind us that the God that we serve, that we appeal to his Father, where is he seated? Over all things. Everything being under his feet, under the sphere of his influence, under his dominion. The Old Testament term would be this, El Elyon. Now we're going to look at Daniel 4. Because the theme of God's supremacy or exaltation is so present in this chapter. Now, the word El Elyon is not in this, but the theme is, in a related term instead is used, but it conveys the exact same thing. Who thinks I should just take my time with this chapter and not rush through it just to get to the next ones? Good, all of us. Daniel chapter 4, we're going to pick up at verse 1. And it's funny that we're spending so much time not only in Revelation, but in Daniel. And I love, come to the Sunday school if you're able, by the way. Even if you've missed prior weeks, you can watch it online, Ginger's website. What is it called? Havenofhopema.org. I got it right. Hey, now and then things work out. But Daniel chapter 4, starting at verse 1. How does chapter 4, verse 1 open? King Nebuchadnezzar. So who's writing this? In a sense, Daniel is incorporating this into his work, but who's the one who's, in a sense, putting pen to paper? It's Nebuchadnezzar, who's about to relay an account or a scene from his life. King Nebuchadnezzar. To, again, think of it as a letter, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth. May you prosper greatly. So again, when you get into chapter 4, there's this transition, this segue from Nebuchadnezzar, who appears in chapter 3, not in a great light, by the way. Now we're in chapter 4, and he's the one, in a sense, addressing the audience as the Spirit of God has inspired him to put pen to paper. It is my pleasure. Now again, who was Nebuchadnezzar? What was his role? King of what empire, by the way? Babylon. How much power do you think he wielded in an earthly sense? The scientific answer is lots. You see, the problem that we have with the Bible sometimes is we're removed culturally from it. We, we have presidents that we vote into power, and there are so many checks and balances against them that they're really radically limited in what they cannot and can do. But you go back into these times where there were kings, they had, in an earthly sphere, limitless power. They could do what they wanted. And Nebuchadnezzar occupied that place. And now he's saying, it's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the, what does your Bible say next? Now, it's not the same El Elyon, but it's a similar word that conveys the exact same thing. The most high God has performed for me. I want you to keep account as to how many times that phrase, most high or most high God, appears in this chapter. If you're okay with circling or underlying, you can do that in your Bible should you desire. If you want to highlight, if you want to do whatever you want to do, I want someone to keep a tally for me. Verse 3, how great are his signs? Now again, when you know what's about to happen, it's amazing he's celebrating God at all. 
And you'll see why in a few moments. But something has happened to this man to bring him to a place to recognize the sovereign power of God, even well above his own as a human agent who had almost limitless power. How great are whose signs? His signs. How mighty whose wonders? His wonders. His kingdom, not his own, but God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. In his dominion endures from generation to generation. You put on the news for a while, you're going to become convinced quite quickly that this world is in disarray, and it's almost as if God has abdicated the throne. No, no, no. He may permit, he may allow. That's been a major theme in the book of Revelation, by the way. But who's king of kings and lord of lords always, without equal, without rival, without exception? It's him. Now, here's where the story begins. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace. And what was his condition, by the way? He's content and he's prosperous. Things are going great. He's living the dream, gang. And then he has a dream. Verse 5, I had a dream that made me afraid. Not many things made Nebuchadnezzar afraid, but this did. As I was laying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind, they terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise guys, well, wise men of Babylon, be, see, it's a pagan nation, and I say wise guys because the people that he's about to bring in, for the most part, they're, 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 they're pagan agents. But he brings them in, brings in all the wise men of Babylon to be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them my dream, but they could not interpret it for me. And then finally, verse 8, Daniel. He came into my presence, and I told him the dream. Now skip to verse 9. And I, Nebuchadnezzar, said, Belteshazzar. That, by the way, is the, is the Babylonian name for Daniel. Chief of the, of the magicians. And it's funny that that's how Nebuchadnezzar viewed Daniel. Again, Daniel is an exilee. He's been taken from his home and brought into a pagan land. Nebuchadnezzar is a godless man, a pagan man. He doesn't understand in many ways the nature of the one true God, though things were about to change for him. I know that the spirit of the holy gods, plural, which is interesting, is in you. And no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. And I can hear the, 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 the imploring nature of his words. Daniel, interpret it for me. Again, he's terrified. He's been afraid of what he has seen. These are the visions I saw lying in bed. I looked, and now he's about to share what the dream was. And there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. I want you to use your imagination. Can you see it in your mind's eye? A tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and it touched the top of the sky. Or, sorry, its top, top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful. Its fruit abundant. And on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From, every, from it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called out in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal until seven times. Literally seven years pass by for him. Verse 17, this decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High... My counter is, what number is that? Beautiful. Is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. 
This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, Daniel, tell me what this thing means. For none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can. See, there's a recognition. There's something about Daniel that's different. Born of experience, too, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now, all eyes this way. You're Daniel. And the most powerful human on the planet has called you in to interpret a dream. What do you make of that? So, yeah, so be, what in the world am I supposed to do? How am I going to interpret your dream? You see, unless God begins, to in, God begins to intervene here and give Daniel wisdom, he runs a real risk of running the king afoul, and that rarely spells good news. Let's go to verse 19. Because you're going to see now the interpretation of the dream. This is a long chapter, but it's worth seeing it in its entirety. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. You see, he doesn't want to get this wrong. Because again, to get it wrong, or to come back with no answer, may not prove well for his head. So the king said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its meaning alarm you. In other words, I'm, I'm willing to take the pressure off. And now he begins to answer, my lord, if only the dream had applied to your enemies in its meaning to your adversaries. The tree that you saw, here comes the interpretation, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to wild animals and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. So let's stop for a second. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he has this dream of an enormous tree. Who is the tree representative of in the dream? Nebuchadnezzar. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. Your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze and the grass of the field with it while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with wild animals until seven times or seven years pass by for him. This is the interpretation. Now imagine being on the receiving end of this prophetic word. Your majesty, and this is the decree, the most high. You see, there's a point to this. God is, is, in a sense, showing who really runs things. The Most High is issued against my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from people. Oh, God, I just want you to speak to me. I want you... Well, you're about to live with the wild animals, buddy. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven seven times. How long? Seven years will pass by for you until you what? Until you acknowledge that the Most High, until you come to understand that the Most High is sovereign, He rules unrivaled and unchallenged over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone He wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven does what? Rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. In other words, Daniel is saying, you've had a rough dream. I'll see that, buddy. But let me just, before I go, give you a free two cents. Renounce your sins by doing what's right. In your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then, that then, your prosperity will continue. In other words, king, O oh king, there's an off-ramp to this. If you're willing to repent and just serve the Lord and recognize his greatness now, you don't have to go through any of that. Maybe the Lord will relent and yet have mercy. Well, the plot's about to thicken. Go to verse 28. Because do you think that Nebuchadnezzar listened? Why are we just so, so stubborn in persisting in a direction? How many of you have kids? When they were little, true or false, they're pretty stubborn. Even when you tell them don't do something, what do they want to do? Do you think that urge really gets any better? 
I think I was hanging out with my friends, the Lees, a week or two ago when all of our kids were just running roughshod and causing mayhem. I think I said to Tim, God has eight billion of these. <laughs> See, we're not any better. Nebuchadnezzar, this king of, of kings in a sense, you'd think he'd hear this interpretation of this dream and smart enough now. Verse 28, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, God allows a year to go by to see if he was going to be receptive to the interpretation in the dream. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, what did he say? Is not this the great Babylon? I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power. Who's the focus here? Who's the emphasis? Who's the object of his adoration and affection? It's himself. Then sings my soul, how great am I? I'm not going to sing to you because I love you. By my mighty power and for the glory of whose majesty? My own. Gang, he was just warned. You renounce your pride. You humble yourself. And God will allow you to go on and exalt you even further. Even as the words were on the man's lips. So while he's singing his own ode, a voice from heaven comes. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You see, we think that the people who were in power got there purely by their own accord. No, the Lord, the Lord raises up and he causes them to fall. That's why I don't stress too much over elections. Do elections have consequences? They do. And I don't know why people vote for what they vote for. But ultimately, who's the one that puts up and who's the one that takes down? It's the Lord. So can I tell you some friendly advice for November? Settle down a bit. Cast your vote and then be quiet. And then whoever gets in, pray for them. Because the God who's still the King of Kings and Lord of Lords can still rule even over someone like a Biden or a Trump or potentially a third or fourth party. That was a good point. Very few amens on that one. Your authority has been taken from you. You see, I've lived the last four years of my life pastoring through crazy times and people get all caught up in the human drama. Do your part and then move on. Let the world go crazy. You represent and serve the kingdom. And more importantly, the king who reigns. You'll be driven away from people. And you're about to live with the wild animals. You're going to eat grass like the ox. Seven times. How long? This isn't a weekend. This isn't a month. Seven years will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the, keep count, is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth. And he gives them to anyone he pleases or wishes. Immediately what had been said about him was fulfilled. Now consider the condition of the, I almost feel badly for him, but not too badly because he had ample opportunity to fix things. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like the ox. How many of you want to eat grass for lunch? Not me. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of the bird. Can you imagine the poor people that had to potentially attend to Nebuchadnezzar and keep an eye on him? Where's Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, he's out in the field somewhere. He's, he's looking a little rough. Seven years go by. We're almost done. At the end of that time, at the end of how long? I, now again, this is Nebuchadnezzar writing after the fact. See, he's the one presenting chapter 4 to us, incorporated into the book of Daniel. I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. See, something happened after seven years of eating grass and not combing his hair. He felt a bit rough. He looks up, and it's in that place as he's, he's brought low and he looks up. That's when things begin to fall back into place. And then I did what? I praised, I celebrated, I exalted in who? The Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. Now look at this beautiful characterization of the Most High God. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. Not insignificant, but comparatively powerless. He does as he pleases. 
the powers of heaven, and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now it's going to conclude with this, 36 and 37. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became what? Even greater than before. Those who are willing to who exalt themselves will be what? He experienced that firsthand in a brutal fashion. But those who are willing to humble themselves will be what? We see that principle in operation long before Jesus himself even said it. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, and he closes with this, I praise and I exalt and glorify who? Not himself anymore. Not his own greatness, his own sense of supremacy. No, I glorify the king of heaven because everything he has done is right. And all his ways are just. Gang, he was just put out to pasture for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, you want to know what his conclusion was? God, you were right to do that. You were just in doing what you have done. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning, book of Revelation. Things fall apart in our lives. And how often do we kind of raise our fists to the heavens and say, why, oh, why, God? As though he's somehow unjust or unfair or unkind. No, no, no. A man who had just suffered through a particularly bizarre form of judgment. As far as I know, it's singular in the whole of the Bible. His conclusion was on his knees, God, you were right and you were just to do everything that you have done. And this is the conclusion. Those who walk in pride, oh, he is so able to humble. El Elyon, this God who is most high. What was the final tally, by the way, for the most high gods? Six times in one chapter. When you read the Bible and you see repetition, it's meant to catch your eye and arrest your attention to draw it to the fact that, hey, this theme is important. God still reigns. I watched the news last night. Wars of rumors of war. If you don't know, Iran is attacking Israel. They've had battles since October. Things ain't looking so hot. But you know what? I'm not rattled by it. Because I know who that is. And even if things out there get difficult, I can know peace here. We can know peace among one another and reach as many as we can. Because the kingdoms of this earth, they're fit to perish anyway. They really are. The time will come when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior. And for me, I cannot wait until that day.